terms of economics and production globally, uh, you know, behind only rice, wheat, potatoes, maize, and cassava. Uh, China is the largest producer globally, 80% of the global production of sweet potato. They use it, uh, they, they incorporate it in a lot of products, use it uh, uh, for development of industrial goods and starches for cooking and for liquors. Um, as they do in a lot of Asian countries, and they eat all parts of the plant uh, in other parts of the of the world. They also use it as a livestock forage, and um, especially in swine production. Um, like I said, very diverse. Uh, six most important crop globally. That has to do with uh, its sort of unique mix of uh, macro and micronutrients. So. Uh, carbohydrates being a sort of uh, an energy provider, a macronutrient for human nutrition, and then a lot of vitamins and minerals, um, which really uh, makes it unique uh, compared to other starchy tubers. All parts of the plant are edible. We obviously most uh, commonly are consuming the root. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, center of origin, um, there is um, some intrigue around uh, actually pinpointing the exact uh, domesticated origin of sweet potato. Um, Central and South America are the most uh, commonly cited locations. Um, but if you really want, I won't have time to do this today, but if you go into a deep dive on um, the uh, ethnobotany of sweet potato, you'll see that there were very early incidents and findings of sweet potato in Polynesia uh, prior to European uh, exploration of the Americas um, and a lot of interesting theories about um, how sweet potato managed to move uh, all that far into Oceania so early on. Um, and you can see a little bit about the diffusion of sweet potato historically, uh, major development and domestication in the Americas then brought over by European explorers through Europe into Africa and Asia, um, actually, although is now the largest producer, was the last to, um, to be producing the crop, historically speaking. Uh, and then looking at Kansas, Kansas was, uh, as well as the uh, U.S., uh, throughout the U.S., uh, when agriculture was more diversified throughout the country, Kansas was a major producer of sweet potato. Um, grew very well in river bottom areas around the Kansas River. Our first Vegetable Growers Association, which is now the Specialty Crop Growers Association um, that I work pretty closely with and was mentioned in the introduction, was originally uh, called the uh, Kansas Sweet Potato Growers Association. That was the original title for our uh, largest um, uh, Specialty Crop Growers Association. And it just shows you how significant the crop was early on uh, in American history from colonial period uh, all the way through the Great Depression where on average uh, Americans were consuming 25 pounds per year. Just to put that in perspective for you, in 2018, uh, sweet potato consumption per capita was uh, about five, uh, five and a half pounds per person. So uh, obviously a, a huge focus on homesteading and, per, and growing your own food. Uh, in that uh, part of the 20th century, and sweet potato was a major part of the diet. Today, as uh, we've talked about a little bit, there are kind of four major states when it comes to commercial sweet potato production. North Carolina and California are, are sort of by far the largest uh, producing states, and Mississippi and Louisiana um, kind of make up the, the remaining percentage of uh, what we mo more commonly see in our uh, retail establishments uh, and large uh, grocers, as well as processing. Uh, like I said, sweet potato is really unique in that it provides a really even mix of both macro and micronutrients. Uh, uh, a uh, staple crop provides a lot of energy, also provides a lot of nutrition, potassium, magnesium, good for blood pressure, calcium, um, healthy bones. Uh, vitamin A is probably uh, what I'll focus on the most in terms of uh, nutritional significance. Um, sweet potatoes being used uh, is really being celebrated and there's been a lot of energy put into breeding efforts to maximize the, the beta-carotene content, which is already quite high 
in orange flesh varieties and using that to uh, combat um, uh, um, childhood blindness and a lot of degradation to vision and, um, and uh, blindness in the developing world, sweet potatoes become a major, uh, what they call a biofortified crop or a crop that's being bred to uh, improve the nutrition, especially in the developing world. It's, it's, it's really important. Um, and uh, the title of the presentation was uh, the powerhouse, sweet potato powerhouse. And that just comes back to a CDC article that was published a few years ago, uh, identified sweet potato as one of just a few fruits and vegetables um, in, our, in our common diets that, um, uh, like I said, provide that uh, breadth of nutrition, uh, potassium, fiber, protein, calcium, iron, uh, a variety of minerals and vitamins, as well as protein, carbohydrates, some of those uh, macronutrients. This just showing a little bit of information, and, and we'll make these slide sets available to anybody who wants them, but showing how different cooking or preparation methods with sweet potato affects the levels of beta carotene, which is important when you're trying to improve diets in developing countries, making recommendations on how to prepare sweet potatoes to get that maximum carotene, beta carotene content. And so I'm going to, mm -hmm. I am going to yeah. take us into a little video, which is something I just started experimenting with in Zoom. So give, give me just a second. And uh, I should be doing this in the middle of my presentation, but the, I just want to give you guys a little um, more of a, a visual, audio visual on how sweet potato is being used. Um, by international agencies like the International Potato Center, which is based in Lima, Peru, the biggest research center for sweet potato, and some of their efforts on um, combating uh, disease uh, uh, due to malnutrition in Africa. And so I'm going to just be patient with me for just a second. I'm going to stop sharing my PowerPoint. I'm going to do a new share. And... Sharon, just interrupt me if the audio doesn't come through, but I think I figured out how to kind of do this. Tonight, 7,000 miles from New York in the East African nation of Rwanda. Zach, I'm A Thanksgiving staple some working. take for granted oh, is changing lives there. Jim Axelrod gets to the root of a sweet solution. These Rwandan villagers are singing songs of gratitude. <laughs> thankful for what some aid workers have brought them, a particular type of sweet potato. Nearly half the kids in rural Rwanda suffer from stunted growth. Many others have vision problems, both due to diets lacking vitamin A. The nonprofit International Potato Center made introducing this type of sweet potato, chock full of vitamin A, a priority. There's no better sight than when you go to the field and you see a kid or a mom or a household eating orange flesh sweet potato. Dr. Karimi Sindhi is the organization's head researcher in Rwanda. He oversaw the years of crossbreeding to naturally create this potato that can thrive in the country's unpredictable climate. I think I can be a part of changing the world. And the reason is there shouldn't be a reason why some people should be hungry or have no food. Two of Uva Mejan's six children had started to lose their vision when she was able to start feeding them sweet potatoes, funded in part by a $4 million investment from USAID. The color of my child's eyes changed, she said. After she started eating orange flesh sweet potatoes, the eyes turned back to normal. For years, Drusella Yanka Deje, a widow, lived in poverty. I was so poor, she says, I had to beg for clothing. Now she grows sweet potatoes so successfully, she's been able to hire other women. 
I feel so happy that I've become a woman of importance in my community. Since orange flesh sweet potatoes are just about the only variety consumed in the U.S., Dr. Cindy says a story about fighting hunger in Rwanda should carry special meaning here today. I would want Americans at home to, to, to understand that the yam or the orange flesh sweet potato they eat there over Thanksgiving mainly and they take it for granted. Whether it's here, there or anywhere else, a smile on the face of a once hungry kid, that's something for which we can all be thankful. Jim Axelrod, CBS News, New York. Absolutely agree, Jim. The many blessings of a bountiful harvest. Well, that's the CBS Evening News for this Thanksgiving. For Jeff Glore, I'm... And hopefully you guys can hear me again, and I'll come back to my PowerPoint. I love that video, um, and hopefully you guys were able to enjoy it, and I think it just... Um, really underscores the significance of the crop um, like at a global level and how it is empowering uh, obviously uh, on women entrepreneurs in that video and obviously supporting nutrition of children um, and something that um, obviously uh, this time uh, with COVID-19 uh, it adds a new layer of significance and relevance to um, how gardening can uh, be a major part of food security and, and nutrition in our community. So let's see, share my screen here. Um, and hopefully you can see my slide set again. Uh, in terms of how K-State got involved with sweet potato uh, research, like I said, largely had to do with uh, having access to planting material and uh, one of our two horticulture research centers in the state uh, one is in Hayesville and one is in Olathe, Kansas. Uh, our Hayesville research, horticulture research station is uh, our um, sort of headquarters for sweet potato research. And some of the master gardeners in the uh, room may, be, may have met our specialist and the director down at the John C. Paris Center, um, Dr. Jason Griffin, who was my co-advisor in graduate school. And uh, mostly uh, a um, uh, ornamental plant researcher, shade trees, and uh, a lot of ornamental shrubs that they uh, do trials on down at the John C. Pear Center, but they also grow several acres of sweet potato um, and produce the planting material to distribute to farmers throughout our region. Um, and in 2015, uh, for example, uh, we're able to provide planting material, sweet potato planting material to 90 farmers in 27 states. Zach, um, Zach yes. can I interrupt you here? Because the video, yeah. the, the slide now mm -hmm. um, is very, very blurry. I don't know what's somehow switching from the video to your slide uh, made it unreadable. Hmm. Uh, all the, the slides that you're seeing now is blurry. Ah, now it's better. Okay. And that's in, like for each, everyone's computer, that might be differently, but if you're seeing that in the chat, um, and I may, at some point, if it's too bad, I might have to turn off my video or we might have to ask others to, to turn off their videos. That will also help the sort of uh, smoothness of the, the Zoom transmission is what I've been told. So if, if you are having... Uh, minute, any, we went back to blurry. Going back to blurry, yeah. It's hard to sort of troubleshoot these things in real time. But um, if you turn off the video on your screen, you stop sharing your video and you mute yourself. That should help the, the smoothness, so to speak. That's my best tip right now. Um, but um, like I said, um, two, two horticulture research centers, but I was based at the Olathe site. I'll show you some pictures from both of these sites uh, in terms of uh, uh, what are more commercial methods for uh, sweet potato production. And uh, obviously had a, some large harvest there. Um, these are some of the objectives for the research project that I was involved with, which were more focused on um, could, could uh, we produce planting material or vine cuttings, which we'll talk about in more detail uh, in a 
could it be economically feasible or profitable for farmers to do that locally? Because we have a shorter growing season than some of the uh, states that I mentioned where sweet potato is the uh, cash crop and more widely produced, uh, would we be able to produce both the planting material as well as the uh, marketable root uh, in the same season in a more temperate northern climate and using high tunnels to do that. We'll get into a little bit of sort of the botany or biology of sweet potato here. Um, it, it's a, what's referred to in, in botany as a geophyte or a storage organ, um, like a bulb or a corm or a tuber. Uh, in this case, sweet potato is a root. Um, it is the storage organ in the sense that it compiles carbohydrates during the, uh, the, the warm season or the dry season in the tropics. And then uh, that uh, below ground portion is what allows the plant to survive and uh, uh, is perform as a perennial crop. Unlike the um, potato, the Irish potato, uh, a common name to differentiate in between sweet potato and uh, Solanum tuberosum and sweet potato Epimoea batatas, uh, two uh, botanically different, distinct uh, plants. Um, and uh, potato is a uh, annual her herbaceous, uh, senescing at the end of the year, dying back. It is not a perennial plant um, by its nature, unlike sweet potato, which is uh, when grown in tropic regions. Um, and Zach, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but okay. people are still having issues with it. Mm -hmm. Um, can you actually stop sharing and then start sharing again? Just sort of redo it and see if that helps. We'll try. Sorry about that. How's that look? Uh, apparently it's good on some people's and not on others. If everybody else <laughs> could turn off their videos, let's see if that helps. What's it look like on yours, Sharon? Um, actually, it goes back and forth on mine, um, from pixelated to fine. Hmm. Well, um, I can try turning off my video as well. I don't know how many we have on the chat, but we had about 160. I did this presentation yesterday. We're having too many issues. So any better, Sharon? It is on my end and I'm seeing some, yes, I'm seeing that people are having, are, it's much better. Yep, I think that's working well, now. I'll go no video and you guys just won't be able to see my handsome face, just kidding, um, for, uh, you know, until we get to a Q&A here and see if that helps. Um, so anyway, I'll get back to it here. Potatoes, uh, differentiating potatoes and sweet potatoes, um, sort of the major features uh, that uh, you need to be aware of, obviously planting potatoes in the cooler season, uh, performing better during cooler weather. So we're planting uh, in uh, mid-March or during the late part of the summer for a fall crop here in Kansas. Sweet potatoes we're planting right in the middle of summer and really trying to take advantage of the warmest days of the year because that's what it prefers. Uh, this is just a picture of cutting up some of uh, some seed uh, potato with Irish potato. We don't do that with sweet potato because of the high sugar content. Uh, they tend to rot when they're cut. So um, that's why we produce from vine cuttings instead of uh, seed pieces or root pieces. Um, the potato is actually also a stem tuber, whereas sweet potato is a true root tuber. The eyes on the potatoes are nodes like we're more used to seeing on a, um, on an, on a uh, stem. And uh, whereas with the potato, uh, we're seeing more of the formation of the roots happening uh, uh, vertically rather than horizontally and all uh, growing around a central stem uh, where a slip has been transplanted in a sort of a hill planting in this picture. Um, comparing some of the, this, this slide is actually just blurry 
regardless, and I apologize for that, this table just showing a little bit of the comparison, nutritionally speaking, sweet potato, um, uh, more complex carbohydrates considered a healthier food in terms of nutrition and a, and a high beta carotene content. Sweet potato is a part of the morning glory family. That's why if you've ever seen the blooms uh, on this plant, they uh, have that sort of uh, very similar to a morning glory uh, uh, bell shaped, uh, really beautiful flower. Uh, if you're interested sort of on a genetic level, it's a very complex uh, hexaploid, so six pairs of chromosomes. That's what makes it really difficult to produce from seed. Um, you, you heard the researcher uh, refer to the potato as a yam, which is a common name, and I know that a lot of the master gardeners in the audience are probably all too familiar with common names being used for multiple species and being uh, confusing. Um, you know, yam, uh, a uh, true yam is the Diascorea uh, genus, and there's five different species in terms of the common, commonly consumed species of, of root crop uh, that, are, that are true yams. Uh, botanically distinct different species from sweet potato, uh, lower uh, um, uh, vitamin content, uh, starchier uh, eating quality, and uh, harder uh, um, uh, uh, root skin and, um, and much larger roots. And you typically are not going to find a true yam in the grocery store, but at a specialty or um, uh, ethnic markets here in, the, in Kansas. A lot of diversity of uh, color, uh, uh, both skin and flesh color. And, a lot, and we're getting access to a lot more variety. But truthfully, if you want more, there are so many different species of sweet potato and, and uh, so many unique combinations, flesh and skin colors and flavor, sugar content. Um, it really behooves you to uh, try to grow these and uh, by doing so you have access to a lot more varieties uh, by purchasing uh, slips from nurseries that specialize in, in more heirloom varieties. But these are some of the more common varieties. Uh, Beauregard uh, with the sort of uh, the tried and true copper skin and, and really orange flesh that's probably the, the quintessential or the iconic sweet potato that we're probably more familiar with. These Murasaki or the uh, sometimes called Japanese sweet potatoes with a purple skin and a white flesh, uh, very starchy, high sugar content, uh, really nice for baking, For uh, they get very crispy. They're one of my favorite for um, eating at home. Um, the, the Hannah sweet potato is a white skin and white flesh, purple stokes, is a, an, an example of sort of a Japanese style, but with a, a, a purple, um, uh, purple flesh as well as a purple skin and, and very high in anthocyanins. You can see a, some, K-State had bred a purple variety that was alphanumeric P40 uh, a few years back and did a, um, a promotion where they were uh, using the, the um, Baking Science Institute to uh, produce some really good looking purple sweet potato pies that they gave out on Thanksgiving. And with the, with the purple flesh varieties, you're instead of beta carotene, the, the nutritional element that um, is really important is the uh, antioxidants in, in these sort of blue and purple pigments that we're familiar with in grapes and blueberries, but uh, can also be found in certain um, uh, sweet potato varieties. And this is a, um, a table showing, comparing some of the common uh, purple flesh varieties and this P40 variety, which still isn't widely available, but was a, a purple flesh variety that, sweet, that uh, K State had bred um, back when we had a sweet potato breeder here. Um, so I've talked a lot about, yeah, go ahead, Sharon. Zach, uh, just there's a question um, and with regard to the varieties in the chat box. Yeah. Um, yeah. Saying that um, this person gets a much lower production um, with the purple than the, with the orange or white. Is there something about growing these different varieties that's different? Oh yeah, I mean absolutely. I mean variety, yield will be highly dependent on variety and, and, um, and also fertility requirements. Um, and so it's just be mindful that if you have a certain types of sweet potato that you really enjoy, or there's some exotic variety that you're really interested in growing, that they may, uh, may not be as widely available because of the um, fact that they're low yielding. 
Um, so just keep that in mind. But it can be fun to grow different varieties, even if they are less productive. Um, but just be mindful that if you're really trying to grow food for sustenance um, or a, a varieties that are high yielding for a food pantry or something like that, that you might want to stick with something uh, more like a, a Beauregard or a cup, um, some of the orange flesh varieties. But there's so much diversity that it would be hard for me um, to, to tell you that there's to totally walk away from purple flesh varieties, but I think that they are uh, more low, more low yielding. Um, in regards to planting material, like I said, uh, pr produced vegetatively. So we're actually take, we're sprouting sweet potatoes in the early spring. And that's why I think that this presentation, the timing of this presentation is really perfect. Um, I would really recommend that if you're, you're interested in trying to, to see the whole production cycle, it, it, it's something that you can do reasonably at home. And I hope we'll kind of do that. We'll show a few photos on what that production cycle looks commercially and what can be done at home to emulate that uh, system for a home gardener. Um, but uh, most commercial plantings are produced from vine cutting that you can see on the right, which is uh, sprouted from a, uh, a root tuber harvested in the previous season. You know, a small, probably a small portion of, of every farmer's harvest is reserved as seed stock that is sprouted in the spring. And then from those sprouts, these vine uh, cuttings, we call them slips. Uh, and that's, I, there's some debate over what, where that name came from, but people would them or pull them off of the um, sweet potato. I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. I'd actually recommend uh, cutting in terms of uh, this, the sanitary protocols and trying not to transmit soil borne disease, but uh, a slip nonetheless, and uh, usually 10 to 12 inches. And then those are very simple and doesn't require any sort of uh, rooting hormone. Um, they're, they're very vigorous uh, at sending out adventitious roots from their nodes. So you can see all the node points or um, um, uh, branches off of the main stem on that uh, picture on the right. And that, those are all the nodes where it, it will send roots that will develop into the, the delicious sweet potatoes that we love to eat. Usually takes about uh, six weeks to sprout a, a 10 inch slip and about 110 days for transplanting that slip to produce a sweet potato. A little bit more about uh, research at K-State, looking at the perishability of this planting material. So when you're ordering from nurseries on the coast, uh, shipping during the middle of the summer or late spring, slips are exposed to high temperatures. How does that affect the quality of the planting material and how productive they are? And so we've been doing some research on optimal storage temperature and, um, and how, how uh, storage and shipping influences quality of sweet potato production. And usually they're, they're, even if you get them in poor condition, which you often will uh, when ordering from other states, uh, because they are so highly perishable and tender, uh, they're still, as long as you have just a little bit of new growth, a little bit of apical or meristem growth at the top, you can remove all of those um, uh, branches off of the stem. And just like I said, trying to get three or four nodes below the ground. Um, and this is just showing you some of the larger production states distance from the Midwest and how that sort of leads to uh, lower quality planting material. And that's kind of why K-State got into uh, this research uh, within the last 10 or 15 years. I'm going to show you some photos now of what commercial production looks like for the planting material, which is really its own sort of enterprise. And it's probably something that maybe most folks have seen before, even if they are familiar with um, sweet potato production, they purchase slips from a nursery and they've grown their own sweet potatoes. They may not have a sense for how those slips are produced. Um, usually they're pre-sprouted in March, uh, mid, early March for about two to four weeks to really start to get some of the uh, chemistry going, uh, going on inside of the tubers uh, to start the initiation. It's really heat, a little bit of heat and moisture to start the uh, adventitious buds to start to uh, push out shoots. And uh, from this point, about two to four weeks uh, at around 80 degrees 
and uh, 80 to 90 relative uh, humidity, uh, the, those uh, pre-sprouted tubers are laid at ground level and covered with just a little bit of soil. In some cases, especially in northern climates, we'll use a plastic mulch over the top of those beds after they've been covered with a little soil. As soon as we start to see any sprouting, we remove the plastic mulch. That's usually about two weeks after they've been bedded. And then they start to develop these really fantastic canopies that we can just go in and harvest two guys with a guys or girls with a pair of shears and then boxing up in these bushel boxes at about a thousand vines uh, per bushel box. And uh, just to give you an idea, uh, usually about 13,000 slips will plant an acre and uh, about 500 seed roots will grow enough slips excuse me, about a thousand seed roots, so a thousand sweet potatoes can produce enough slips for an acre. And you can do that easily in a, about, um, let's see, about a hundred square foot space. So you could produce enough slips uh, in, a, in, a, in a small plot of about a hundred square feet for, a, for one acre planting. Uh, sourcing planting material for home growers is really easy. Uh, going to the grocery store, I would really recommend selecting organic varieties only because conventional varieties are sometimes uh, treated with a, a sprouting inhibitor. And so uh, selecting organic variety will give you a, a much quicker chance at, at developing um, uh, some sprouts this time of the year. In, tw in 2017, during uh, my uh, research uh, at K-State, we had to ship in several pallets of bushel boxes of seed roots, and uh, that was a total mess. Um, sweet potatoes are really delicate, and with uh, especially the roots, when they're exposed to variable temperature and uh, poor handling conditions, they have a tendency to, uh, to rot very quickly due to different decay organisms. Um, but uh, able to use those seed roots in 2016 and 2017, salvaged some of them, and uh, we were investigating different densities, plot densities, and how that affected our slip production. Uh, and you can see what commercial uh, equipment looks like. In this video. This is a bed shaper that's used to cover the potatoes after they've been laid on the ground and makes these really uniform beds that we can lay plastic mulch over the top of. Um, using high tunnel production to, to investigate whether that could help us extend the season, get planting material earlier. We're usually looking at trying to have slips available to producers by early June, uh, late May, early June. And uh, so using high tunnels to try to speed up that process. And that was a part of the research uh, in 2016 and 2017, and you can see sort of the, cu uh, uh, the cumulative uh, effect of using both plastic mulch and high tunnel in this picture to sort of build up the heat units and get those sweet potatoes to sprout as quickly as possible. On a more of a home scale, uh, less mechanized system, which we often had at the Olathe Research Center, you can see one of my colleagues here uh, really getting quite a workout covering the roots and then just using some plastic sheeting from the hardware store and rebar to weigh down uh, our propagation beds. But uh, we're still really productive nonetheless. We, you cut some small slits in those beds in the spring just so you can have some gas exchange and there's not carb, carb, um, CO2, uh, high CO2 concentrations. But as soon as you start to see any slip development in those propagation beds, you're pulling off the plastic sheeting and, uh, like I said, have some really uh, uh, dense canopies of slips that you can harvest from. Um, and some uh, undergrad interns that were helping me with my research that year. So that gives you sort of an idea of what it looks like at the commercial scale. Um, and just in terms of uh, if you're going to go out and try to purchase your own or if a farmer is trying to figure out how um, profitable or economically viable it might be, you can see that slips really range in price from anywhere to a, a couple dollars a slip for some of the heirloom varieties that you can see here on the left hand side of the screen. This is the Sand Hill Preservation Center, which is one of the nursery, nursery, it's a nursery in Iowa, and it's really in terms of the, the 
the quantity and diversity of varieties that they have of sweet potato. I think over 300 different heirloom varieties, um, but they are able to to uh, charge uh, a premium price for their product because of the the niche that they serve and some of the um, more hard to find varieties that they provide slips for. And then you can see some of the larger nurseries, um, kind of like Johnny's, uh, selling for something kind of closer to 50 cents a slip. Uh, just to give, to give you a little more context, how that compares to commercial growers sourcing materials, sourcing material or slips for acres of production. Uh, if you were to purchase from Kansas State University, you would spend a quarter of the cost. Uh, so they have about a thousand slips for $450. You might purchase one of those bushel boxes from K-State or from a large uh, slip nursery for commercial producers for um, like 150 160 dollars for a thousand slips so it just depends on your market who you're growing for really dictates the value and what and what sort of varieties you're working with this is sort of the finished product if you are a, a sweet potato nursery this is what you're shooting for you can see these bare root cuttings um, really freshly harvested uh, there's there's no root development these have just come out from the field and then they're shipped to the grower and hopefully will go out uh, will be transplanted in the field within five uh, five days uh, more or less sometimes when you're purchasing from nurseries here locally you'll see you'll see some root uh, development um, these are these are really more what I would call bare root cuttings where you actually are seeing some root initiation. Uh, that's because these have been pulled from the root rather than being cut at the soil line. Uh, nine times out of ten, you're not going to have any problem with growing a crop from a, uh, from a vine cutting like this, but commercial producers will prefer a cut end uh, for phytosanitary reasons, uh, just trying not to um, transmit any disease uh, from, from the soil. Uh, and obviously, uh, methods for doing this at home, there are a lot of them, and most of you guys are probably familiar or did a science experiment in, at some point in your uh, education, uh, probably early on in elementary school, sprouting a sweet potato in a jar with a few toothpicks, and, and that works. Um, it, it helps if you know which end is that there is sort of a, an up and a down end or a proximal and a distal end on a sweet potato. So the, uh, you might remember from the, the photo that I showed of the morphology of the sweet potato in the, in the beginning of the presentation, um, they grow uh, vertically up and down in the soil and they have a tendency to sprout more from the top. Uh, or the or the end of the root that develops closer to uh, the soil line um, and usually it's easy to figure out because that's going to be the more rounded uh, sort of uh, wider rounder top whereas the distal end or the end that uh, the bottom side is going to have a more tapered uh, sort of uh, like finishing off in sort of a, a tail or a more narrow uh, end. I probably have some pictures that I can uh, show a little bit that a little bit more clearly. Pre-sprouting at home can be very simple using uh, it's a really kind of a poor quality photo but a brown paper sack where I, from where I purchased uh, seed roots or just some sweet potatoes that were for sale at the grocery store and you can just barely see it but I'm using a, a seedling germination mat to sort of pump the temperature and I'm also closing that bag the, so those sweet potatoes are respiring and they're putting off moisture. And then with the heat pad underneath it for a few weeks, you start to have these adventitious buds that will develop on the, on the root. And then that's a really good time to either use this jar method where you're submerging at least, uh, you know, roughly one third, but as long as you're getting an inch or so of the bottom uh, part of the root. And you can kind of see what I'm talking about where you have the top of the, of the sweet potato is more rounded um, and the, the, the bottom end is sort of more tapered. Um, it's going to have a tendency to sprout more from that top side. So if you can submerge the bottom end, that's better. Uh, the only thing that I don't really rec reason why we tend in extension not to recommend this method is just um, it provides a lot of opportunity for bacteria to develop. You need to switch out the water pretty consistently, but 
you know, you know, very quickly you can have an Instagram moment with your uh, new, your newfound tropical house plants uh, that uh, will turn later turn hopefully into an edible crop in your garden. This method has become more popular and more recommended through extension services using greenhouse trays uh, with some uh, holes for um, uh, to uh, release moisture um, and uh, using either a, a coarse uh, builder sand or a potting mix to just lightly cover the roots. Uh, still using a, a, a heat uh, pad can be really helpful and uh, or even like this is a little six inch uh, pot that I recycled from the nursery and using some of the smaller roots, uh, we call them canners that maybe aren't as marketable or um, desirable for, uh, for eating, but make really good seed stock nonetheless. A small root will produce just about as many slips as a larger one. And so uh, maximizing the space in your containers with smaller roots can be really helpful. Um, using a, a small fluorescent light, or if you have access to a really strong uh, light from the south facing window that can be helpful but you really do need light uh, and that will help keep the distance in between the nodes uh, more close. You don't want like a leggy slip. Um, you want a, a strong sturdy fine cutting uh, to transplant from. And you can see why they're used for ornamental purposes and, uh, and I think that the process of, of sprouting them at home can really be fun and they can really, you know, they can be attractive indoors and outdoors. Um, and uh, you can, you know, if it's, if you've started your potatoes too early and they're starting their, your vines are getting out of control, you can uh, continue to take vine cuttings and sort of pot those up as need. And uh, the only thing I would say is, a lot of people harvest their sweet potato slips and then they put them in a plug tray. I have one of those with me right now I can show um, later on, but um, I would not recommend uh, if you are purchasing slips that are grown in plugs, uh, it, I would really recommend uh, trying to cut the slip above the soil line as long as it's long enough for you to get three or four inches below the ground and I can when I turn my video back on, I can kind of show, demonstrate this a little more. Um, but instead of planting the plug in the ground, trying to get a, uh, trying to get the vine itself and multiple node points below the soil line, uh, it can help you get much more uniform uh, production of uh, the sweet potato root. Just some other methods for propagating slips using raised beds and um, low tunnels. Uh, like I said, this example, they're producing in a six by 12 uh, raised bed. Uh, they, they were able to put in 500 seed roots, which can produce a, a one half acres worth of planting material. Um, I won't go into too much detail on this because we're kind of running short on time, but uh, just be aware that when you're recycling plants, you're, you're uh, producing slips from the same recycling your, your roots and producing slips off, off them year after year, there is the potential for virus accumulation. So be on the lookout for certain types of malformities, either in the foliage or you can see some of this russet cracking or leaf spotting, uh, chlorotic spots within the veins or spotting on the leaves, uh, black necrotic tissue in the roots. Uh, if you're recycling planting material year after year after year, uh, there is some chance for virus development and that's why it's important to to bring in a certain percentage of clean virus tested certified uh, slips or planting material on a regular basis especially if you're doing it for commercial production so with the short amount of time that i have left we'll get from the slip production into root production um, like i said Planting time, mid-May through early July. I would really say early June through early July is probably more typical. Uh, you want soil temperatures to be at least above 60, but probably closer to 70. Someone that plants slips, uh, transplants their slips in May, and, and then their neighbor who plants them two or three weeks later may actually harvest around the same time because it's less dependent on time and more dependent on heat units, which you're going to accumulate a lot more of later, uh, more 
towards the beginning and middle of summer. Um, really perform well on marginal soils. Uh, you don't need a lot of fertilizer. The spacing is important. Make sure you give them a lot of space because they will, uh, the vines will, will really uh, cover your uh, planting area. So at least 12 inches of spacing between the plants within the row and then at least two to three feet between rows. Uh, water well, especially when you're transplanting. And here's some examples if you don't have a large garden space, really can work well in a raised bed. I've seen folks get really creative with burlap bags and, and this is even a, a shopping bag. I'd say you probably want at least a 10 gallon container. On the far left hand side, you can see some of the uh, fabric nursery containers. Uh, that are sold uh, for potato, uh, Irish potato production, but that work well for sweet potato as well. Um, this is some examples of ornamental varieties. Ornamental varieties are genetically the exact same as the edible varieties. They're just bred more for their foliage and less for the quality of, or, or flavor of the roots or for the size of the roots. And so uh, you, you may not find that the eating quality of the roots that are produced from ornamental varieties are all that good. But this is actually, a, I pulled this picture from Louisiana State University where I just noticed in the last um, week or so that they put out a press release that their breeders at LSU, one of the biggest uh, universities for sweet potato research, has been partnering with a uh, nursery to develop varieties that are truly both ornamental in terms of these sort of chartreuse and magenta color foliage and also producing really high quality eating roots as well. This is what field production looks like and these plants will look pitiful once you put them um, in, in the ground. But um, this is just an example of how simple it is. Uh, you do build a ridge either with a bed shaper or just using a hoe to create a sort of raised planting area that's probably about two feet wide and eight to 10 inches high. And then, like I said, trying to get at least half of that 10 to 12 inch slip below the ground. And it's less about the length and it's more about the, those nodes, trying to get uh, at least three nodes below the ground. And very quickly, uh, it'll consume the space. You won't have to worry about watering or weeding after about six or eight weeks. We were taking some measurements as a part of the research project and we're, we're recording slip lengths that were over five, six, and seven feet. Um, fertilization, like I said, it, it really is a notable crop in terms of being able to perform, perform on marginal soils or soils with low fertility, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't need any fertilizer at all. Obviously, it'll be dependent on a soil test, which uh, hopefully you guys all do with your local extension offices, but um, generally speaking, a, uh, a balanced fertilizer or uh, a really just a, a nitrogen rich fertilizer if you already have high levels of phosphorus and potassium, which I know in Johnson County is pretty common that baseline levels of, of P and K are pretty high. Um, and so really just recommending uh, a pre-plant fertilizer Maybe a starter fertilizer dissolved a couple, ta couple tablespoons of dissolved uh, fertilizer in a gallon of water and about a half cup that uh, you use to water in the, the stem cutting when you transplant it in your bed. Um, watering, like I said, it's really important the first few weeks and right after transplanting to get them established. But after the first month and a half, uh, they, be, they really create their own living mulch and they hold moisture really well. Be careful to not water too close to harvest, like the last three or four weeks before harvest, because you'll see some um, expansion after root has already uh, developed for the most part, which will lead to cracking like you can see in the right hand side. So really holding back on any uh, irrigation in the last four weeks before harvest. Some of the major pests for sweet potato, we fortunately don't have to deal with. Uh, diseases like scurf uh, are really not very common in the Midwest. You will see some grub damage, especially if you're planting in an area that was previously planted to turf or sod. Maybe some wireworm damage, larva from beetles. Uh, wireworm is one of the biggest sweet potato pests, but it's not something that we encounter a lot here. 
Um, really the, the major pest issue that, that I tend to see are vole and deer damage deer on the foliage and uh, rodents like voles chewing on the roots. If you can uh, build some sort of barrier or fence around your planting, that can be helpful. But when the deers eat the, the leaves, uh, the plants are so vigorous that they're able to recuperate quite quickly. Uh, like I said, harvest happening 90 to 120 days after planting that stem cutting. Um, usually growers are looking for the vines to start to senesce or yellow. Uh, as an indicator that the crop needs to be harvested. And, and that will happen, especially if, you, if your um, days to harvest are coinciding with our first frosts. Um, you will, the plant is so frost or, and cold sensitive that you will start to see the leaves yellow uh, early in the fall. And that usually is a good indicator to pull them up. Uh, however, if you plant earlier in the season and you wait till our first frost, you'll probably be stuck with um, gigantic sweet potatoes. We call them jumbos. And I'll show you what those look like, which are not typically desired for marketing purposes, but if you're trying to win the biggest sweet potato at the state fair, um, getting them in early and waiting to harvest uh, closer to 150 days uh, will get you there. Um, and usually what I recommend to folks is just pull a, a test plant out on the on the buffer or the end of your row and look to see what the size of the roots are if they're uh, if they're within the range that are desirable for you and what you want then uh, that'll be pretty indicative of what the rest of the plants are going to look like down the row and it's time to harvest and you can see what uh, commercial harvesting equipment looks like I think in this video <laughs> chain digger that's uh, used for harvesting in larger operations and really convenient, this kind of conveyor belt that cuts the soil and brings the roots up. Uh, we usually cut the vines, which like I said, are so uh, expansive and, and so vigorously growing during the summer that it's easier to harvest if you can cut them back and remove them from the field before you go out there with your buddies in the pitchfork and uh, try to cut them out about a 12 inch, uh, 12 inch radius around the, the planting uh, and uh, really loosen the soil well before you pull them up because they are so fragile and they will break easily. So really loosen the soil well before uh, removing them. Uh, really quickly on curing, uh, one thing that a lot of people forget to do or don't put a lot of time and attention into, but is it's really extremely important. Um, it, it will add to the longevity of their, their ability to be stored and it will also improve their eating quality and their sugar content. It will give them the ability to, to, to sort of, um, uh, to dry out any wounds and develop a stronger skin that, like I said, will allow them to be held in storage for a longer period of time. Uh, that process is called superization. If you want to uh, impress your friends with some new horticulture vocabulary. Um, but really when we're curing, it's right after harvest. We're trying to get the sweet potatoes to about 80 to 90 degrees and high relative humidity. And it may sound like you need to go out and buy a space heater and a humidifier, but what I would tell you is that if you're harvesting enough uh, and you can get them in a box, uh, those sweet potatoes are respiring. They're putting off humidity, especially when they've been fresh harvested. So there's your relative humidity. They're also putting off heat in respiration as well. So if you can get enough of them close together and get them in a warm room and, and in an enclosed space, it doesn't, you don't want it to be completely uh, um, closed that there's no gas exchange, but something like a waxed produce box in the middle picture can be really uh, effective tool and uh, like I said, storing it somewhere dark but warm uh, for about a week to 10 days. That'll help uh, strengthen the skin and uh, prepare them for what we call cold storage or long-term storage, which is gonna be, uh, you're gonna take them from the attic, so to speak, down to the basement or the cellar where you're shooting for something like 55 to 60 degrees. You still want that high relative humidity so by storing uh, a lot of sweet potatoes close together, 
uh, down in a, cool, in a cooler temperature area, you can get anywhere from three to six months of storage and be eating sweet potatoes until it's time to plant them again next year. Um, I know it's, I'm kind of past my time here, but I'll just show you really quickly how we grade sweet potatoes um, for, uh, for wholesale production or for folks that are growing for market. Uh, we have this nice little tool that helps us uh, identify what our number ones or our most marketable, which is usually somewhere in between two and three inches in diameter and uh, three and seven inches in length. And, uh, you know, I always make this joke that, you know, if you have any kids watching right now that this, you know, might get kind of provocative. It's sort of a stupid joke, but anyway, um, it's kind of like here at the end, uh, some of these really uh, um, bizarre shapes uh, that you that you get when you are harvesting sweet potatoes at home. But um, yeah, like I said, uh, jumbos are fun to take to the state fair, but not what uh, growers are looking for in terms of marketability. Um, and you can kind of see what some of those look like. And that just comes with leaving them, leaving them in for too long. So what we're really shooting for are sweet potatoes that look like this. And that's a ton of information, but I think I'm going to stop there, Sharon. And uh, if there are questions, I'd be glad to take them. Thank you guys for your time. Well, thank you, thank Zach. You. Um, I, we've uh, don't have, there's a lot of discussion in the chat box about where to get sweet potato slips. Um, but I don't have any questions in the chat box. So if you if people are, that are on the program want to go ahead and type questions in the chat or go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question verbally, we'll try it that way also. I just wanna say thank you while I have a chance. So thanks, Zach. Thank you for having me. And when it comes to where it's sourcing sweet potato slips, so it's kind of, there's kind of a double-edged sword. I think the timing is great for this presentation because like I said, it's a really good time to try sprouting sweet potatoes at home um, for the first time using some of those methods that we discussed, whether it's submerging in a ball jar or um, using a, a, a baking sheet, a muffin tray uh, with some potting soil and lightly covering uh, some roots that you, you buy from the grocery store, keeping them moist and warm. Uh, but if you want to purchase from the nursery, we're kind of getting towards the end of the season for making those orders. Uh, I did a quick check last night and there still are a few online seed companies that are taking orders for sweet potatoes. But what I would tell you is if it's something you wanna, um, if it's something you're interested in, it's, it's usually you're making those orders earlier, uh, late winter, early spring. But there are definitely still places either online or um, I know like, uh, I think Cotton's Hardware in Douglas County uh, usually has uh, slips available, and I'm not sure um, if they'll, what their plans are, but it might be worth reaching out to them. But definitely places online, uh, different seed companies online that still have smaller quantities available. And that uh, Sand Hill Preservation Center, if you're, if you're interested in some more heirloom varieties, uh, they would be worth checking out their website and seeing if they have any uh, orders still still open. Other people in the group talked about getting them from Pines or from Clinton Parkway here in Lawrence. Well, I love Lawrence, but I, you guys are going to be more the expert on that than me. Yeah, there's a question for anybody to answer um, if they know of a place in Manhattan to get slips. I know Brits is is kind of getting into slip production now. Um, and I think they're trying to sell for more wholesale, but um, if you call the, the Brits uh, farm and market, they probably would uh, have an idea. Um, another question here that came in the chat box is what is the outlook for corn soybean growers to transition to sweet potatoes as cash mm -hmm. crops related to meat shortage in the long term? Yeah. That's, that's kind of beyond my expertise. Um, I think there's probably a lot of obstacles uh, or barriers to transitioning from our more um, standard commodity crops to a, a specialty crop. Although 
you know, part of K-State's interest in research in the crop is definitely for, for uh, diversification value. And uh, from a research perspective, um, it's, a, it's a crop that's really well suited to our environment. And, um, but like I said, there, there are a variety of factors for why farmers grow what they, fa what they farm. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think that's all I can really say about that. You also mentioned, we're, we're going to make this recording available, um, but during the presentation, you mentioned some slides. Um, is, is that just these presentation slides, or are there other slides that you might have that could be made available? Uh, well, I would recommend, uh, I, there's more, if you're looking for more how-to guides on uh, growing sweet potatoes at home or growing your own slips, um, the Johnson County uh, K-State Johnson County Extension page has a few articles that I've written there that are kind of uh, kind of nicer one pagers uh, and then of course like I, I'll make these slides available it's a really large it's really image rich uh, slide set so it's really large but I'll try to figure out a way to make it available to you Sharon either as a PDF or something um, that we can share with attendees Great, and I will be making this available on the Douglas County Extension webpage. It will be under, uh, I believe it's Garden and Lawn, and there's a section there under Growing Vegetables. I'll go ahead and put the link in the chat box so you can look to it later uh, when after I've been able to pull the uh, recording and place it on the website, but I'll put the link to our website up here in the chat box. Oh, and I also have the article that Zach mentioned from Johnson County um, that he wrote that I put the link up in the chat box for that article. I noticed another question. It asks if after harvest, if the vines are good for the compost pile. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and we didn't really talk about it too much, but, you know, experimenting with, um, with different recipes that feature the, the stems and the leaves um, and harvesting those during the season, you're not going to be able to eat enough to stunt the growth uh, of the plant. Um, so, you know, taking cuttings and, I, and my understanding, and, and, I've, and I've experimented with a little bit, but especially in Asian um, cuisine and cultures that, uh, that where it's referred to as morning glory, uh, used in soups uh, and sauteed, um, but uh, really similar texture and, and flavor, uh, tenderness to spinach. Nice. Zach, this is Reggie. Um, hey, Reggie. When you were going through the, the part about the nutritional values in sweet potatoes, I've done, I did a little research a couple years ago related to the high sugar content. Uh, so, you know, like you can eat too many sweet potatoes and, and take a chance with your sugar levels. What do you have to share about that? And are there some varieties that are higher or lower in sugar and starches? Well, I'll just preface it by saying that, that um, I'm not a dietitian or um, my background really isn't in nutrition, um, so to speak. Um, my understanding is that um, in terms of the glycemic index that uh, sweet potato is preferable in comparison to uh, our more standard uh, Irish or white potatoes uh, because of the complexity of the carbohydrates. Um, but there are definitely differences between in, in the varieties and varieties that do have, do have a higher sugar content than others. Um, and with a, a, just a little bit of research, I think you would be able to identify the varieties that have lower sugar content because of how researched the crop is, because of how it's used for uh, fighting malnutrition in the developing world. There is ex a really extensive information on nutritional composition uh, for each variety. Uh, and so I guess my, my best recommendation would be to, um, to try to do, do that research and identify a variety that might be lower sugar content and, uh, and, and trying to grow those varieties. 
Thank you, and I wanted to say thanks, and I do appreciate your presentation. Thank you, Reggie. Yes, thanks from, uh, from me, too. This is Rebecca Stark in uh, Manhattan. Great, my hometown. Are there questions? The only thing I have in the chat box, um, again, is one asking for any kind of who uh, the expert might be on speaking to sweet potatoes about being a cash crop. And then there's also a comment, so just to let everybody know out in the chat box, from the last question, um, one of our master gardeners writes in that the glycemic index for the sweet potatoes can depend on whether it is baked, boiled, or steamed. Yeah. That's definitely true. That's one of the slides that we didn't go into in, in too much detail, but um, not just a, a lot of information on nutritional values by variety, but also a lot of information out there, vetted information from universities and research institutes on how different preparation methods uh, it, it affect um, the composition on a nutritional level. So that information is, is, is available. It's out there. It's not my expertise, but it's available. Well, Zach, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for Karen, having me. Karen, anything else from your end? Nope. Do we have any other last minute questions out there? No? Well, then I would just say thank you all for attending. Um, I did put the link for the Douglas County Extension up there, Lawn and Garden. So check back there for future presentations. Um, Chris, you want to give a highlight of what's coming up? So we have uh, Luann Johnson coming next month to talk about preparing flowers and vegetables to exhibit at County Fair. We have no-till gardening that will happen in July, rain gardens in August, restorative landscaping in September, and the Kansas Land Trust in October. Great. Well, Great thank you all everybody. for coming and thank you, Zach, very much. Um, look forward to seeing you all, seeing you all soon, we hope. Yes, I hope someone sends, mm -hmm. I hope I get photos of sweet potatoes. Thank you. I hope everyone's yes. encouraged to grow some this year. Yay. Thank you again for having me. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Zach.